30 years ago when uh, folks like Dr. Wes Jackson at the Land Institute uh, brought up more widely the idea of perennial green crops, many people thought it was, number one, just uh, biologically impossible to have high grain yields and uh, in, in a perennial crop. Since then, things have changed due to uh, advances in modern plant breeding. So plant breeders now have more tools available to them. They're able to uh, utilize some of the DNA sequencing tools. But I think more fundamentally than the advances uh, in plant breeding in terms of uh, developing greater appreciation for perennial grain crops, is just the greater awareness and the tremendous environmental problems that we face globally from agriculture. In these state of the planet assessments done by agronomists, ecologists, economists, agriculture has been identified as the number one threat to biodiversity and ecosystem functioning of, of all of our human uh, behaviors. So there's much greater awareness now that, that in order to feed uh, a growing population, we have to come up with some radical, radically new approaches to producing food. Perennial grain crops is one of those approaches. We, we see perennials as, as part of systems in feeding world populations and, and basically giving value to smallholder crops we think is, is quite critical. So um, again, mostly we look at giving farmers and growers options of how they can include these into their systems. The implications for the private sector are um, revitalizing local communities and agricultural systems and grain economy. Uh, we see the value coming into the communities themselves in terms of um, increased and more efficient livestock production and grain production and integrated types of systems that will help local communities. Perennial cropping system hold a tremendous potential in the world to increase food security, to retain soils, to help increasing resilience to climate change. So this is why we in FAO decided to hold a meeting to bring together scientists, so social scientists, soil experts, agroforestry system experts, perennial crop, legume, oil seed experts, to talk together, to talk together about the potential, what is known and what is not known about perennial crops and perennial cropping systems and what remains to be done all together to bring this very promising and very important topic further and to improve many of our poor and depleted cropping systems by adding perennial crops into them. We're very conscious of the nine billion people expected to be on Earth by 2050 which requires, I think it's a 70% increase in harvested grain available to feed the world. That is focusing the minds of some research providers and donors on focusing on grain only. As we go into some of those environments, it becomes much more of a diversified agriculture where livestock and other animals are important. And often there is a, a seasonal problem of having sufficient materials to I guess maintain the animal's condition and hence result in good outcomes. Um, things like perennial grains uh, could assist in that process if we have adapted plants of a dual purpose nature. Perennial grain systems address multiple sustainability goals. They don't just look at yield, they look at making sure that the environment is protected, that systems are economically viable and that we actually can benefit the well-being of communities. More recently, we've looked at options such as doubled up legumes, where you take a crop soybean or common bean and you intercrop it with pigeon pea. Now pigeon pea is grown traditionally and sort of old-fashioned crop, popular in certain parts of the world where it's eaten like in India and even in southern Africa amongst subsistence farmers, 
but it's gone out of favor. In fact, sometimes it hasn't even been funded in big projects about grain legumes because it's not the highest yield potential. But what's interesting about it is it can be ratoon. It can be cut after it's harvested and then it regrows. So it's a shrub that provides all these extra services. So we've gotten more and more interested in crops that are, sometimes we call them the third way of legumes. These third way type of legumes are either shrubs or vines that provide some grain immediately, but also the extra ecosystem services of protecting soil from erosion, uh, fixing nitrogen, in case of the perennial legumes, not in case of perennial wheat, although perennial wheat, uh, we're testing it, but it seems to be able to conserve nitrogen and improve water quality. The field of perennial crops has changed, I think, enormously in the last 30 years, particularly with the development of concepts around agroforestry, the integration of trees into farming systems to produce environmental benefits, social benefits, uh, and economic uh, outputs uh, in ways that are building on local tradition and culture in the tropics uh, and opening up new opportunities for people's livelihoods. And that's really taken off enormously over the last 30 years, but still needs, has a long way to go. Um, the implications for feeding the world are that there is, uh, trees can be used in two ways. Firstly, to improve um, the quality of, of products, because many of the traditional foods which are rich in micronutrients uh, have been lost from the wild uh, and by bringing these back into the farming system you create the opportunity to diversify diets uh, and build micronutrients into, that, into those diets. That's the first point. The second point is that by integrating trees into the farming system you have ways of closing the yield gap. That's the difference between yield potential and what farmers achieve. And so trees have a role to play in improving the agroecosystem. I, developing um, income generation in ways that are going to uh, re may mean that food security can be improved uh, and we can move towards sustainable intensification. Uh, as the world population increased recently, uh, especially in developing countries, for example China and uh, India, so we need um, more food for, to feed this population. And in the most mountain area, so for the, in this area, and the, the crops yield not so high, like this uh, rice or wheat and the, uh, sorghum. So in the mountain region, we need to develop perennial rice, uh, both for food and for environment protection. Well, I, I think they, they, they are huge and um, if I would be in um, uh, in, in industry or plant, ble plant breeding industry, I would just jump on this topic because the, um, the advantages, the possible advantages are huge um, as modern agriculture is very devastating for soils and I think that the perennial crops are a way to uh, not only to, to um, um, maintain the quality of soils, but also to improve the quality of soil. So I think it could be a win-win situation. Since 1950s, whenever uh, the people needed more extra food, they, they used to bring uh, more new areas, uh, more more uh, land under cut cultivation to fulfill the requirements of the increasing, rising uh, human population. But now we are at a stage where we don't have uh, unlimited land and unlimited water resources. So we have reached to a point we need to use, uh, get better use of plant genetic resources to develop new varieties uh, that can feed the increasing uh, human population. And one of the options is to develop perennial, uh, at least perennial food security crops such as uh, wheat, barley, rice, maize so that uh, under arid conditions we, are, we don't have uh, a, a predicted pattern of rainfall or we don't have enough water at the time we want to plant. So perennial, wheat, uh, perennial crop varieties once we plant and if there is uh, not enough rain, still they are alive and whenever there is enough moisture they can, uh, they can start germinating and uh, they, they can provide us uh, 
uh, at least uh, good yield of greens. I got started in, in working on uh, these perennial crops, perennial grain breeding in specific. Um, I wanted to do this since I grew up on a farm and uh, heard about it when I was maybe 12 years old. Uh, I was watching sort of this decline of perennial crops on the landscape and saw the tremendous potential that perennial grains would have, uh, primarily for the ability to benefit multiple areas with the one change to agriculture. So we could have environmental uh, improvements, we could have social improvements, economic improvements, um, basically all at the same time. The economic improvements coming through a reduction in the uh, purchased inputs that would be needed and the efficient use of those that are applied. If you see annual crops, you produce uh, every year, which means there is land preparation uh, every now and then. But um, when it comes to perennial crops, you plant it once and maybe you harvest several times for maybe three, four years. That means like uh, inputs uh, for tilling and for uh, weeding and so on would be minimum as compared to annual crops. So carbon emission that is related to uh, tilling, for example, would be minimum. So it is more environmentally friendly than annual cropping systems. And uh, also, the perennial crop stays on the ground for a longer period of time, uh, which covers the surface and which reduces uh, soil erosion and also the root systems in the soil that can reduce nutrient leaching from the soil. So in that sense it is more environmentally friendly than the annual cropping system. Um, soil biodiversity is really very uh, massive, it's really diverse, so if you take one handful of soil it might have about 5,000 species of soil organisms and they all work for the quality of our life and our challenge is to uh, see how they do that and uh, how we can make use of it. The nutritional aspect um, of these materials is quite interesting because um, of the presence of some, some, some compounds which are well known for their positive effect on health. This means that uh, perennial wheat can also help in terms of nutritional quality, not only on the productivity or on the environmental uh, aspect. We need to see food energy uh, producing landscapes that are sustainable and resilient and these are the ones that can bring multiple benefits so ecosystem services of course um, high quality food and nutrition feed and fodder for animals um, and really protecting the, um, the environment. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities to do that. Now, of course, the trees are going to be perennial, but the crops don't, um, aren't always perennial. And this is where we have a huge opportunity. So we have, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have particularly one tree, we have many trees. One is called Phyderba albida, and that tree drops its leaves during the rainy season, creating a beautiful mat on the ground, and it's leguminous, and then the crops come up afterwards. And where the crops are grown under the trees, you actually see a much improved growth and farmers say it's up to 10 times the, the productivity and you're also building the soil and you can actually see where a tree is not. So just a little bit of shade cover and protection of the soil and nutrients and it's a dynamo but we have a huge opportunity in both grazing systems and in, in, in agricultural production systems that are mixed with trees. So perennials, clearly an answer. So please read more about perennial crops and perennial cropping systems and help us understanding and promoting those technologies which are so important for the future of our good agriculture. Thank you everybody.